Success in Clinical Trial Landscape live webinar. We are excited to have you all with us and look forward to an exciting discussion with the faculty. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping notes to review. The AUA is accredited by the ACCME and designates this internet live activity for a maximum of one AMA PRA category one credits. The AUA would like to thank AstraZeneca and Merck for providing independent educational grants in support of this activity. Finally, I'd like to extend a special thank you to our course director, Dr. Ashley Ross for his time, talent and expertise in developing this program. So, um, for this webinar, the, to address the documented need from the 2019 AUA Global Needs Assessment in Advanced Prostate Cancer, the American Logic Association has developed a series of educational offerings uh, that are focused on PARP inhibitors. This is the second part of the series, and we're going to focus on the clinical trials that have led to the FDA approvals of PARP inhibitors in metastatic cashew-resistant prostate cancer. The first part, focusing on genetics and in particular germline testing, um, is available at the AOA University website, and we encourage you uh, to look at that if you were not able to make that webinar, and also to join us for the last part in upcoming weeks, where we'll talk about implementing um, um, some of these new therapeutics and precision medicine in uh, our practices, and particularly in the community setting. We have a few learning objections, uh, objections for today. Um, at the conclusion of this activity, we want you to be able to describe the role of the enzyme poly-EDT ribose polymerase, or PARP, in carcinogenesis, as well as the mechanisms of PARP inhibition. We want you to discuss clinical, um, uh, clinical trials that were associated with PARP inhibitors, particularly the Profound and Triton studies that led to some of the currently available um, approvals for PARP inhibitors. We want you to describe the patient populations that were associated with each trial, the clinical outcomes of each trial, and some of the limitations of these trials. Now I want to introduce uh, two friends of mine and, and experts in the field and also constant advisors for me, um, both medical oncologists. First is uh, Dr. Emmanuel Antonarakis. Uh, he's a professor of urology and oncology at the Johns Hopkins Sidney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Sec Center. He's also the director of the Prostate Cancer Medical Oncology Research and the co-director of the Prostate Cancer Multidisciplinary uh, Care Clinic at Johns Hopkins. He graduated from the University of Wales College of Medicine in the United Kingdom, and he completed his residency in internal medicine at the Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center and then fellowship in medical oncology at the Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital. Since 2010, he's been on the Johns Hopkins faculty uh, as an attending uh, physician and a translational researcher in the Department of Oncology. Dr. Van Hanarakis's clinical interest is in the management of prostate cancer and other GU malignancies. His research is focused on drug development and clinical trial design for patients with prostate cancer, as well as for cancer genomics. More specifically, he's looked at developing novel antigen-directed therapies, genetically targeted therapies, and immunotherapies for, for men with recurrent or advanced prostate cancer um, using precision oncology with genetics and genomics. He's been looking at the development of liquid biomarker, uh, biomarkers such as ARV7, and he's currently the PI of several phase two and phase three clinical trials, serves as an active member of the Prostate Cancer Clinical Trial Consortium, and the ECOG Akron Group, as well as the NCI Prostate Cancer Task Force. Finally, he's on the NCCN panel, and he also serves on the editorial board of uh, Journal of Onc Clinical Oncology. I'm very glad that he's here tonight. He's a true expert in the field and a dear friend. I also am welcoming Dr. David Vanderweel. He's an assistant professor of medicine at the Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine here at the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Vanderweel did his medical and research training at the University of Chicago, where he developed a research program that focused on the ev evolution of the cancer genome. He moved to the NCI, where he continued to seek uh, ways to improve the treatment of men with prostate cancer, and specifically look looking at genetic changes and precision medicine in this regard. He then returned to Chicago in 2018 and joined the team at uh, Northwestern um, Memorial and Northwestern University, where he continues his efforts to translate discoveries from the bench to bedside to improve therapeutics. 
His research efforts focus on um, potentially altering the lethal course of prostate cancer. These include investigations into PI3 kinase signaling and the implications of P10 loss, as well as ways to maximize uh, the effectiveness of PARP inhibitors. From a clinical standpoint, since um, uh, he understands that many men uh, who die from prostate cancer will progress from the localized or regional state, he uh, has an interest in helping maximize early treatments for prostate, uh, er, early uh, treatments for that are multimodal for men with aggressive prostate cancer. Welcome both Dr. Uh, Anton Arrakis and Dr. Vanderwill. Very glad to have you um, today. And to jump right into um, segment one, um, we're going to first talk about the role of um, PARP in carcinogenesis and also mechanisms of, of PARP inhibition. So Dr. Vanderwill, we, we often hear about um, um, DNA, to DNA damage response or repair genes. Um, what, what are those genes? What kind of categories do they fall into? What do they do for the cell and what do they do in carcinogenesis? Yeah, good question. Um, so there are many DNA um, repair pathways within the cell. Um, the ones that we are especially interested in uh, for prostate cancer are homologous recombination repair, which are the ones that we're gonna be focusing on tonight and uh, mismatch repair, which is really a separate topic. One more uh, associated with immune therapy. But the homologous recombination pathway uh, includes genes like BRCA1, BRCA2, um, as major factors uh, involved in repair of, of DNA damage. ATM is another big player in sort of signaling that damage. And um, so it's really the homologous recombination pathway that uh, really is the focus tonight and associated with, uh, with the PARP inhibitors. And, you know, how, how often, David, do we find these uh, genes mutated in, in men with prostate cancer both maybe at the germline level and then talk a little bit about this at the somatic or tissue level? Yeah, good question. So um, at the, um, well, first uh, looking at any alterations, either germline or somatic, um, we're probably somewhere in the range of 25 to 30% of advanced prostate cancers. Um, at least that's what was found in the profound study that we'll get to later. Um, in terms of the ones, the genes that are most strongly um, associated or the most frequently, we're more in the uh, 15 to 20% range. Um, and uh, BRCA2 especially is the most frequent and also the gene that we're most interested in here. Um, so ballpark range, about 10% of, of patients with metastatic prostate cancer have an alteration in BRCA2 and probably about half of those or 5% are germline mutation. So uh, yeah, and BRCA1, uh, you know, it's close, uh, close partner, um, probably about um, uh, 2% or so, and about half of those are germline mutations. Overall, <laughs> um, we think about somewhere in the ballpark of 10% or a little bit more of folks with uh, metastatic prostate cancer have germline mutations in a DNA repair gene. And, you know, Dr. Anthony Arrakis, you know, um, you know, Dr. Vanderbilt was talking about BRCA1 and 2 being important, ATM being a regulator, and there's other genes that are involved, obviously, in homologous recombination. Are, you know, are there some genes that kind of rise up as, as maybe more important or less, less important? Are all the mutations created equally? Does it matter if one allele is lost or both? Just expound on that a little bit for us. Yeah, there's at least 15 genes that are involved in the homologous recombination, but they're not all created equal. Um, the very central players are BRCA1 and BRCA2, and then there are a number of a little bit more peripheral players. Um, ATM is one of them. ATM is not directly part of the complex, but it signals and it senses DNA damage. There's another gene called PALB2, which uh, is also present in ovarian and pancreatic and breast cancers, which stands for partner and localizer of BRCA2. So that is an interacting protein. And then there are these so-called RAD15, RAD51 genes. The, the long story short is both in terms of prevalence and in terms of PARP sensitivity, the BRCA2 is the king. BRCA1 and some of the other genes are, are modestly important and uh, others such as ATM may not be as important. Now, one of the things that you asked about was the so-called allelic status. 
So every gene has two alleles or two copies, one that you inherit from your mother and one from your father. So for example, the BRCA2 gene in a cancer cell or any cell for that matter will have two copies. So if you have a cancer cell with a mutation in one version of BRCA2, but the second version is normal, which we call wild type, that may not completely abolish the function of the BRCA2 protein. Whereas um, if you have a mutation that was inherited, let's say in the BRCA2 gene, and then the tumor loses or mutates the second copy of the same gene, we call that a double hit or sometimes technically known as a biallelic mutation. And these are the ones, at least in theory, that we expect to respond the best to PARP inhibitors. So maybe David or Dr. Vanderwill, can you maybe expand about, upon that? So we have homologous recombination that's sort of maintaining the genome. Where does PARP fit in and, and where do PARP inhibitors fit in? So uh, PARP is sort of an alternate pathway to help out with DNA repair, which is uh, working in the background. Um, but if you have deficiency in homologous recombination because um, you've lost the function of one of the genes in this pathway, like BRCA2, then PARP becomes especially important because um, that's the backup pathway that's going to kick in then and help out uh, if there is DNA damage um, that needs to be repaired. And so um, it's... Uh, it, uh, by that mechanism then, um, folks with mutations in BRCA2 and these other genes are especially uh, sensitive to PARP inhibition. Um, so if PARP inhibitors come in and block PARP, then um, you're increasing the, the DNA damage to an extent that the cell cannot recover from. So, um, so then two, two questions. Um, I think that there is a there's a few different PARP inhibitors that are out there. Um, you know, um, I mean, maybe, are there differences, maybe Dr. Antonakis, you can expand on like, are there differences between the available PARP inhibitors that we know of? Are, are they available in other cancers? What have they shown maybe in some other cancers like breast and ovarian? Yeah, there's about five of them that have been tested in prostate cancer, Olaparib, Rucaparib, those are the two FDA approved ones. Niraparib, telazoparib, and veliparib, those are non-FDA approved. Um, these these uh, drugs work in two different ways. One is um, they inhibit the enzymatic activity of PARP. Remember, PARP is an enzyme. Um, so they inhibit the, the enzymatic um, PARP function, which is called parylation, the, the, the addition of these ADP ribose groups. But they can also um, cause what is known as PARP trapping. They, they can um, bind to PARP inhibitor and make the, make the PARP become stuck on the DNA. And this PARP trapping, at least in, in the laboratory, seems to be important. Now, in humans, we really don't know if this PARP trapping piece, although a lot of the um, PARP inhibitors tout that theirs is a better PARP trapper versus another. I, uh, my clinical conclusion, and I think that David may agree, is that the enzymatic inhibition is important in the clinic, and that's how these drugs are dosed. But the PARP trapping, that is unresolved, whether that really makes a clinical difference. And as you mentioned, um, there were three other cancers that PARP inhibitors were approved for before prostate. Actually, uh, ovarian, breast, and third, pancreatic, all received the approvals of at least one PARP inhibitor before prostate cancer. Dr. Vanderwill, you know, as a class, um, you know, they, they, a lot of them have overlapping efficacy. Um, do they, they also must have similar or shared toxicities. Can you just talk a little bit as a class for these oral medications, what their toxicities are? Yeah, there are two primary toxicities. One is uh, effects on, um, on bone marrow or cell counts, particularly with anemia. And um, so effects on hemoglobin, obviously, the, and, and the fatigue that goes along with that. Um, and then the other is GI side effects, uh, which can be varied, um, can be loss of appetite, nausea, um, generally more commonly loose stools rather than constipation, but in general, GI side effects. Uh, those are the most common side effects that patients experience. Another one that, um, you know, a rare but serious category would be um, uh, secondary leukemias or MDS. Um, this is seen in, especially in women with ovarian cancer, where there's the uh, most extensive um, experience with PARP inhibitors. Um, in the profound trial, I believe in the initial uh, reports, there weren't any 
um, findings of this. And though in the longer follow-up survival, I think there was um, one incident of a, of a leukemia or, or MDS. Uh, in the ovarian literature, of course, all those patients are also getting, um, you know, carboplatin beforehand. Uh, it's a bit uh, debated, you know, to what extent are there other uh, factors contributing to this versus them being uh, due exclusively to the PARP inhibitor. And then finally, before we go into the specific trials for prostate cancer, Dr. Antaronicus, can you talk a little bit about how do you select people or identify people who might be homologous recombination deficient and may respond to PARP inhibition? Right. There's a simplistic way, which is to look for the gene mutations in BRCA2 specifically, let's say. Um, in the future, I think we will be using these so-called HRD scores, where, where we will either have a functional score of the homologous recombination function or a measure of the scarring of the cell that has happened as a result of the homologous recombination deficiency. None of those HRD scores, which are also called LOH scores sometimes, are, um, are approved as a companion diagnostic in prostate cancer. They are in other cancers like ovarian cancer. So for the moment, uh, it's based on a germline or a, genetic, or a somatic genetic report, which shows uh, something like a BRCA2 or another HRR mutation. And we'll talk about what the 14 genes are that are included in the elaborate panel. Great. And we'll come back to that. Um, just to summarize this first section uh, for, the, for the audience listening, there's a couple key points. One is that PARP functions as a salvage pathway to maintain genomic stability in cells that harbor DNA damage repair deficiencies. So those cells don't uh, repair their damage well, that may help them in some mutagenesis, but can cause catastrophic instability that leads to cell death. And the cancer cell has upregulated PARP to kind of string the genome along and together. Multiple drugs like erlaparib, rucaparib, talzaparib, and rapidib are small molecule inhibitors of PARP. They're oral medications that can inhibit PARP and maybe be the Achilles heel to some of those cancers. Erlaparib and rucaparib have recent approvals for progressive metastatic cancer resistant prostate cancer. And that's going to bring us into our next segment, which we'll talk specifically about the clinical trials for um, PARP inhibitors in prostate cancer. And maybe Dr. Antrakis, you can, you can kick us off. The Profound was a phase three trial of Orlaparib that led to its FDA approval in prostate cancer. Can you talk a little bit about that trial, its design, the men that were involved and what the outcomes were? Yes, so Profound was a study for castration resistant prostate cancer. Patients had to have received at least one of the novel AR therapies like Aburenza, or they could have received both. And they were permitted to receive one taxane chemotherapy like docetaxel, but that was not mandated. They then had to undergo genetic testing from a tumor specimen, either a new biopsy or archival, or a germline test that showed one of 15 HRR gene mutations, including BRCA1, BRCA2, ATM, and 12 other genes. Now, the trial was designed in two cohorts. Cohort A was the primary analysis and the primary endpoint. And that was only involving men with BRCA1 or BRCA2 or ATM, germline or somatic mutations. The second cohort, which was cohort B, involved one of the other 12 genes. In each cohort, there was a randomization. The randomization in cohort A was two to one, either Olaparib or the control arm, which was physician's choice between Abby or Enza whatever they wanted, whatever the patient wanted. The same randomization applied to the cohort B. It was two to one, the odds of getting Olaparib versus Abianza. The primary endpoint of the entire trial was progression-free survival, PFS, in cohort A specifically. Now, the, the complicated factor about this trial, but it's important because it influenced the FDA approval, is that the trial was powered and had a statistical design um, that was designed such that if the primary endpoint in cohort A was met, if PSFS was superior in the elaborate versus control, then they had the permission to do a secondary statistical analysis of progression-free survival in the entire study, combining, adding together, in other words, cohorts A plus B. Um, and the trial was positive in the cohort A, in other words, in people with BRCA1, 2, and ATM mutations, 
they did have a longer progression free survival than control. And because of that, the secondary statistical analysis of the entire population was permitted and was performed. And in that um, overall analysis, including all the genes, not just the three that I mentioned above, the PFS advantage was still seen. And it was for that reason, in other words, that, that the PFS was positive for the entire study population, not just in cohort A, that the FDA's subsequent approval um, included uh, 14 HRR genes, not just the three in cohort A. That's excellent. So Dr. Vanderbilt, so this, this you know, like, like Dr. Antronics mentioned, cohort A, I think it drove a lot of the benefit. So let's talk about cohort B patients um, for a second. How do you approach a guy with progressive metastatic cancer resistant prostate cancer who has a pathogenic or likely pathogenic mutation in, in one of the cohort B genes um, and who's progressed on Abby or Enzo? How do you go through the thought process and what to do next for that individual? So um, I still, I, I consider it, um, but um, I probably put it um, a little bit further down or I'm a little bit less enthusiastic about a PARP inhibitor than I am uh, for someone with a mutation in, in a cohort G, B gene than I am for someone with a mutation in BRCA2. Um, and it depends a little bit on the clinical scenario, um, but I'm not expecting to see the same level of activity or I, uh, not quite the, not the same likelihood of seeing uh, activity in one of these cohort B genes. Do you, two, two follow-up questions to that. One, you know, Dr. Antronarx has mentioned a little bit about these like HRD or, or loss of heterozygosity scores that some of the next generation sequence panels, because they're sequencing so many genes, they can see the, the scarring on the genome. Do you use that ever in your clinical decision making, like, or is it kind of too ahead of the curve for the cohort B population? Um, I have not incorporated that into my clinical practice yet, um, although I I don't think that's a bad thing to do. Um, the data, I, as uh, Dr. Anton Reich has said, I think the data is much stronger in some other uh, in some other cancers. And um, I think that's more because it's been looked at in those other cancers um, and not because um, that's not likely to be beneficial for prostate cancer. Um, you know, we think that um, PARP inhibitors work because there is a, a defect in their homologous recombination repair. I do think that those assays are showing the functional consequences of, those, of, that, of a defect being there. And so, um, you know, biologically, it certainly makes sense that those assays would be helpful biomarkers. Just to say a little bit more about those assays, um, depending on, on what kind of mutations you have or mutations in what sort of pathways, you can get different signatures um, in terms of the, what you see in the genome and how these DNA um, uh, alterations in, G in DNA happen. So with, a, uh, with these genes, like a BRCA2 mutation, you see a lot of um, deletions typically, and, um, and a, which leads to loss of heterozygosity. So you see loss of one copy of the genome. And, <clears throat> and you can see that then throughout the entire genome. So really these assays are kind of a, a functional assay of seeing the stereotypical pattern um, uh, as a result of the of the loss of functional homologous recombination. It's an excellent point that they have because of that, that and how the DNA repair happens in different cells, it needs to be validated in, in prostate cancer. That's the, that's a very good point. Just to bring us full circle, let's say that I, I've got a PAL-B mutation and, and you know, maybe I have a, a higher HRD score and I'm your patient and I'm in co cohort B and you decide to start me on a PARP inhibitor. How do you check if it's working and how, when do you decide to switch therapies? Are we waiting for clinical response, radiographic response? What do you do in real world practice, particularly when you're iffy about, is this gonna work or not? So I, I follow PSAs. Um, PSA is a reasonably good marker here, like, like with many of our therapies. Um, most patients um, that, well, yeah. So 
in, in addition to meeting the primary endpoint of radiographic progression-free survival, a secondary endpoint was um, PSA response or 50% decline in PSA. And it was um, that rate was markedly higher in those who received a lap rib compared to the control arm. So PSA is a reasonably good marker. All these patients have advanced disease. I don't rely on PSA alone. Um, it's, it's a good marker to know what's happening. What's more important is how the patient is feeling and what the scans look like. So also looking for clinical and radiographic progression. Um, but you know the earlier indication is, um, is a PSA response. Now in your particular um, question, um, you said a PAL-B2 uh, alteration. So in, in general in cohort B, um, and actually I would throw ATM in there too. Um, I, you know, I, I don't, uh, I'm a little bit less optimistic about the efficacy of a PARP inhibitor. PAL-B2 though, um, uh, also from Triton or, or from other data, um, I tend to put that, I guess, um, a higher level within uh, cohort B. Um, you know, those numbers are pretty low, but they do, um, it is uh, a member of the, um, of, of the complex. And so I do think that, that, um, that those are relatively likely to benefit from a PARP inhibitor. Um, but, you know, for ATM, so I'd actually swap those out probably. Um, for ATM, I still consider a PARP inhibitor especially if I've run out of other options. Um, and so may, you know, depending on the clinical situation, but may sequence chemotherapy first um, or yeah, sort of it depends on the clinical scenario. To, to that point, Dr. Antonarakis, you mentioned in the trial design for Profound, they were basically guys that had progressed on Abby or progressed on Enza and they were being randomized to a PARP inhibitor versus being randomized to another sort of antigen access signaling modifier. Um, and a lot of people bring that up as a criticism of the trial. You know, what are your thoughts there? Um, and maybe just, you know, what are your thoughts there? Yeah. Well, there's been a lot of editorials written about that, including for the New England Journal, and, and it was fiercely debated by the first author and the editorialists. But that was what we were doing in those days. That's not what we're doing now. So um, it was fair at the time, but, but now it probably would not be a reasonable control arm. The, uh, you know, can you make anything out of it? We'll talk about Triton too in a second, but you know, to me, sometimes I'll look at like, what was the, what was the, the, the you know, size of response for people who were gonna be responders? And was that reasonable to be over what it would have been if I put them on docetaxel or something like this? Can you make anything there? Or is it just too hard to parse out? Well, it's too hard to parse out in that study because it was not compared against the chemotherapy. We, we do know actually that um, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutated patients tend to be more taxane insensitive or resistant and more platinum sensitive. So I suspect if you only did a trial with BRCA1 and BRCA2, comparing a PARP inhibitor versus a taxane specifically, that the PARP inhibitor would probably win and it would definitely win on safety and, and toxicity too. Now, with ATM, it's not the case. ATM is tax insensitive, actually, um, and uh, and perhaps um, platinum sensitive as well. But it's it's not it's not totally taxin resistant. So I guess it, that that answer depends on what proportion would have ATM versus the other two genes. But BRCA2 specifically is quite taxin insensitive, and uh, and platinum and PARP sensitive. It's a, it's a great point. In fact, in, it's a little bit off topic, but there was that ProRepair B uh, study, which was kind of almost like a registry that kind of suggested that people who have, you know, BRCA2 particular mutations, even when they are, are start first going to CRPC, you should probably reach for an ASI instead of a taxane. Um, maybe also take us into, you know, Vanderwell mentioned it, the Triton 2 study. Take us a little bit into the Triton 2 study, um, you know, what was, what was the design there? It's a phase two study. Um, what was the difference between that and profound? Yeah, so big differences and uh, unprecedented stuff happened with that study. The first unprecedented thing is the FDA has never approved a drug based on a single arm trial with no, no uh, comparison group, and, and they did here. 
the, the second unprecedented thing, the FDA has never approved a drug based on objective response rate as a primary endpoint. Now, I, I must say, and this is kind of a detail, but it's important, the approval is an accelerated approval. The drug is still on the market. You can prescribe it. It's fully reimbursed, but it's not a full approval. What does that mean? It means that if the phase three study is negative, the FDA reserves the right to revoke or remove the FDA approval. Now, I don't think the phase three trial is going to be negative, but I'm just saying that it, it was kind of a little bit of a rush and also riding on the coattails of the Olaparib story. So I, there was a class benefit there that I think helped the FDA to approve it. So Triton 2 was single arm. Um, the, the FDA approval here only was for uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. Now the Triton study allowed other genes too. Um, it looks like my light went off. Um, but uh, they chose to only, uh, to only submit the BRCA1 and BRCA2 data for the FDA accelerated approval, even though they had data on other genes as well, which went into a separate publication. So single arm there, no control arm. And because there was no control arm, they couldn't use PFS or OS as primary endpoint because there's really no benchmark and they would be criticized. So they use objective response rate you know, by resist criteria. And they, they got an objective response rate in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 patients of about 40%, which is quite respectable. And they got a PSA 50% response rate over 50%. Um, again, these were all BRCA1, BRCA2 patients. Um, and, and based on that information, the, the FDA said, okay, we'll give you accelerated approval, prove to us that this improves some long-term outcome like PFS and OS, and then we'll grant you full approval. And that led to the phase three Triton three study. Dr. Vanderweel, for the for the Triton studies, for the Triton two, they had to progress on enzalutamide or abiraterone and have had docetaxel. In Triton three, is the same thing true? Do they have to have had chemotherapy beforehand? Oh, you're muted. I'm sorry. Um, actually, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Antonorakis, we're not involved with that, I know, but I, I, I don't want to misstep. Um, right, so, so uh, the, the, the phase two study, the Triton, um, required a, a taxane, so it was a, a third line trial, and that went into the label of the FDA. The, the Triton three trial is a pre-taxane study, so it's MCRPC. You could have received either Abby or Enza, but not both, only one, and no taxane for CRPC. You could have received docetaxel for HSPC, hormone sensitive, uh, AKA charted type of regimen. Um, but these were true sort of um, second line patients post Abby or post ENZA. And they're randomized uh, to either Rucaparib or the control group. The control group has three options in this study actually. Option one is Abby, option two is ENZA, and option three is docetaxel. So the control arm here includes not just the AR therapies, but as you were mentioning before, uh, Dr. Ross also taxing chemotherapy, acknowledging that back-to-back -back, uh, sequential AR therapies may not be the best approach. And then Dr. Vanderweel, the final thing for this segment is, uh, you know, I think there's some gray area for me sometimes in my understanding of these trials. If I had a person, particularly for a lap rib, if I had a gentleman who um, we started off by treating them like, you know, with intense androgen deprivation for their hormone sensitive metastatic prostate cancer, let's say with abiraterone and ADT like Stampede or, you know, like Titan with apalutamide and ADT um, or with, or actually I use a better example would be um, like Enzimet with Enza and ADT. Um, and they progress to CRPC so they've seen that enzalutamide or abiraterone before, but they started when they were hormone sensitive. Are they now eligible for PARP? Are they in third? Are they technically in the next line or do I have to, what has to happen? Yeah, they are. So, um, you know, the approval for a lap rib um, uh, specifically is for um, CRPC, metastatic CRPC, who has uh, progressed and previously received um, Abby or Enza. So um, that could be in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting, as you said, and really more and more of our patients, um, that's really the scenario that we're seeing um, where the, you know, the newer AR targeting agent is used up, so to speak, um, in the hormone sensitive setting. And so, Excellent. yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that, that's good. It's a key point for the audience that, you know, you know, they just have to have progressed and been on those therapies before. Um, 
So just to summarize this, that was the kind of the real meat. So to summarize that, the profound trial was a phase three randomized control trial for men with metastatic cash resistant prostate cancer and homologous re repair gene deficiencies that had two cohorts. One cohort was deficiencies in BRCA1, 2, or ATM. Um, and there, there was actually an overall survival cohort uh, benefit and a progression-free survival benefit. It had a second cohort, cohort B, which had other DNA damage slash homologous combination deficiencies. But when the FDA looked at everything together, because of the trial design, they looked at cohort A and B, and there was a PFS improvement. And so if they approved or lack rib, for anyone with deleterious mutation in, in any of those 14 genes. Triton 2 was a phase two study of root cap rib that also led to an accelerated FDA approval, but this was for men with mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2 that were deleterious, and they had to have progressed through Abby Enza and have had chemotherapy before. So we'll go to the next segment. And we touched about this a, a little bit um, a little bit earlier, and we talked about next generation sequencing assays that um, you know could pick up a lot of these alterations. You know, Dr. Vanderwill, sometimes you know we don't have good tissue to biopsy. They, they're progressing and they have M1B disease only. We know that some of these liquid CT DNA assays are out there. You know, is, is, do they work? Can you identify mutations in in that way? Sometimes do you use those assays. Um, yeah, I do. So you're referring to circulating tumor DNA or plasma DNA. Uh, many of the companies that do these assays on tissue also have their own sort of plasma-based DNA, and there are other companies out there that um, focus exclusively on plasma. Um, I do use them. Um, they were not included in the profound study. Um, they were included, uh, they did both tissue and plasma-based in the uh, Triton 2 study. Um, I, I tend to prioritize tissue over um, liquid assays. Um, uh, I, there are uh, a lot of studies out there showing that if you have a high enough disease burden, and so there's enough circulating tumor DNA, those actually are quite sensitive assays. But um, I tend to prioritize tissue over circulating tumor DNA, but certainly would, um, would accept a, a circulating tumor DNA assay. Um, I think there's some data that um, uh, a, a biopsy of metastatic disease is, um, would give you a little bit higher rate of detecting a mutation than, um, than primary tissue. Um, but um, many of these studies actually, including most of the tissue samples and profound came from prostate tissue. Um, although one interesting thing is that there was a a higher failure rate sequencing for prostate tissue than I would have expected before these studies, but that's borne out in a number of these, which is like 30% or so of the um, sequencing as of, of the time the sequencing assay failed. But um, yes, yeah, circulating tumor DNA certainly is is an option. So two questions for Dr. Infernarakis. One is, um, you know, as people progress through their cancer journey, can they pick up? Some, and do they pick up more somatic mutations? And are they more likely, should you be assessing them at multiple TAM points because they may be becoming um, you know, HHR deficient? Um, that's the first question. That's a great question. Um, I'll answer that in two ways. Yes, over time, certain mutations accumulate in prostate cancer patients, but not the ones that are relevant for PARP inhibition. The mutations that accumulate are P53 mutations, P10 loss, RB1 deletions, and some others, which may have relevance in other therapeutic contexts, but not in the context of PARP inhibitor use. In the vast majority of cases, and this has been shown by studies where they have paired metastatic and primary tissues or paired uh, ctDNA and primary tissues, if the mutation is present in the, the MET, it's almost always found in the, in the primary disease. And we call those truncal mutations that are very early in the evolution of that cancer uh, instead of branch or, or branched mutations. Um, there's a little bit of controversy about that when you go gene by gene, um, but, but for, for BRCA2 and BRCA1 uh, specifically, it does appear that the vast majority of those mutations, when they occur, they almost always, although not in every case, occur in the primary disease. Excellent. So let me just summarize this section um, 
basically heart inhibitors as a, as a class like we talked about before, um, you know, have uh, associated toxicities. We didn't touch on it much in this last section, but just to reiterate to the audience, those could be hematological and gastrointestinal. How do I identify people that might respond to PARP inhibitors? Next-gen sequencing is very helpful. We talked earlier and then just in this last section that we can identify these alterations, particularly BRCA1 and 2 in the germline. And actually germline testing, like we talked about in session one, should be encouraged in all men with metastatic prostate cancer, not just because it could affect their outcomes, but also because of cascade testing and their family members. Somatic tumor testing should be encouraged with all men with metastatic prostate cancer, particularly ones that are progressing to CRPC because now they have the availability of rucaparib and erlaparib. And in some rare cases, they could also have mismatch repair deficiencies or MSI status that can give them immunotherapy susceptibility. Um, we talked about a little bit that maybe men with bilelic loss in BRCA1 or 2 might benefit a little bit more or bilelic alterations uh, may benefit a little bit more from PARP inhibitors because they have a less or more signs of damage uh, in their DNA. We talked briefly about circulating tumor DNA assays. They do work. We didn't really talk about um, um, the, a phenomenon called chromosome, uh, um, a clonal hematopoiesis that can cause some indeterminate mutations, but there are caveats to circulating free tumor DNA, both that you could be picking up minority populations or even have spurious um, results there. So let's go to segment, uh, the last segment, which we're going to talk about some of the future of PARP inhibitors, how we can make them more effective, um, what are ongoing clinical trials. I think this is a um, in, uh, an area where Dr. Vanderwill and actually and Dr. Anarakis have done a lot of work, but I'll start with Dr. Vanderwill. What, are, what do you think is in the future of how do we make these drugs more effective? How can we synergize with other therapeutics? Yeah, there's um, certainly a lot of interest in, in combination therapies, uh, you know, naturally going from one drug to combining with others. So there's data out there that um, actually there's synergy between AR inhibition and PARP inhibition and that may not be dependent on loss of uh, homologous recombination repair ability. And so there was a, a study of abiraterone and elaparib in patients with pretty advanced CRPC, which showed the benefit in biomarkers of positive patients, but also suggested a, a benefit in those who um, were not biomarker positive. And, and now there are a number of phase three studies with each of the uh, PARP inhibitors that we've talked about, um, looking at uh, first-line CRPC combining AR-targeted therapy with, with PARP inhibitors. So that's definitely an area of major interest. Also, um, combining with immunotherapy, um, you know, if you're causing DNA damage, are you more likely to uh, start off a, an immune response or to enhance an immune response? Um, so a number of of different trials looking at that. In addition, you know, radiation is another way to damage DNA. So also studies looking at combining PARP inhibitors with, um, with radiation and getting into some other smaller studies of other ways to try to um, interfere with DNA damage repair. So a lot of combination studies out there, many different spaces, many different sort of classes of drugs that it's being combined with. Then, Dr. Antonio Rockets, I know that you've led a, a, a few trials of moving PARP inhibitors up earlier. Um, you know, what are, what are your thoughts there? Like, how you know how early in the space can we can we move them? Um, and you know, think about the, also the toxicities and how long you'd expose men to any anything that's kind of that you kind of foresee in your crystal ball for the future of PARP. Yes. Yeah, so the first setting is the metastatic hormone sensitive and. Uh, the company that makes Neraparib, I'm not sure if we're allowed to mention names, um, has launched a study called Amplitude, and Amplitude is going to be really innovative. So this is MHSPC, right, first line, and the control arm is basically ADT plus abiraterone plus placebo, which is one of the accepted standards of care. And the interventional group is ADT plus abiraterone plus Neraparib with a PFS as primary endpoint. So if that study is positive, that will be the first study to move out of CRPC into still metastatic, but hormone sensitive. Now, can we go even earlier? The answer is yes. So at Johns Hopkins, we're doing a study with uh, Olaparib for biochemical recurrent patients, BCR. So just rising PSA after prostatectomy. They've never seen hormone therapy. They're non-castrate. And uh, we have treated these men with Olaparib. And we have seen profound responses, no pun intended, specifically in the BRCA2 patients, although there are responses in other genes as well. 
And now at, at the University of Washington, Seattle, they have even done a neoadjuvant pre-prostatectomy study where patients with germline BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations will get a PARP inhibitor prior to surgical prostatectomy. So th these are being used across the spectrum. W what I would say is we have to be very careful about the theoretical risk of MDS and AML. The earlier we use these drugs and for longer periods of time, the longer you use these drugs, the greater the chance of, again, getting this MDS uh, AML problem. And so we will have to be very, very careful in the earlier stages not to include anybody that has any baseline, you know, blood count abnormalities or cytopenias, because the last thing you want to do is take a BCR patient with a 15-year life expectancy and give him AML. You're never going to forgive yourself. Yeah. Excellent. So to wrap up this last segment, um, so PARP inhibitors are being very actively studied. We just heard from Dr. Vanderbilt and Amtron Arrakis, both in earlier disease states and in combinational therapies. There is evidence that androgen um, access inhibition can affect DNA repair, and they may synergize with PARP inhibitors. They may synergize with immunotherapy. Um, and there's going to be a lot of a lot of interest here in in, in looking at things like pulsing, um, you know, pulsing uh, the therapy in other in other ways. Let's take some audience questions just for the last uh, several um, um, several minutes, and then we will go and wrap up with the. Um, with post-test assessment. So let's just take about two or three minutes and do some, some audience um, questions. Um, so there's, there's a, there's, the audience is asking some kind of, uh, some fairly complex questions, but let's maybe start with um, one that's uh, um, a little bit more general. If you have a patient with metastatic cash-resistant prostate cancer, progressing through first line, and a germline BRCA2 mutation, but no additional somatic mutations. So I assume they mean one allele is affected, the other one is not. Would you elect to treat with um, orlaparib or rucaparib post AR failure um, and no prior docetaxel or not and why? It's a good recap question. When you're having the person with a germline mutation, but no somatic mutation, one allele is deficient, do you start out reaching for your docetaxel or do you try a PARP inhibitor first? How do you make that decision? So I, I attempted to answer that partially, and then I, I'd like to hear David's um, take on this. The absence of a confirmed second mutation doesn't mean that one doesn't exist. Most assays don't report them, even if they're there. For example, Foundation Medicine doesn't report the second allele. So you could well have a complete LOH, and they wouldn't report a thing on that. Um, if, you, if you knew for a fact that you didn't have LOH, I mean, that, that's a complicated question. I probably still would would try the, the PARP inhibitor. In the setting of no prior taxane, you, you can't get rucaparib reimbursed. The, the rucaparib label requires and mandates uh, at least one taxane chemotherapy having been used before in the MCRPC setting. So whenever I've tried to prescribe rucaparib in someone that has never received a taxane, it's always de denied. So, so And it's off-label, and it's probably not the most responsible thing to do. Um, I think olaparib has a longer track record. The, the safety, I think, is better. Uh, rucaparib causes LFT abnormalities, which is not the case with olaparib, so it, it does have some liver damage. Um, and again, in the absence of a taxane, you, you would technically be off-label with uh, rucaparib. Dr. Vanderbilt, anything to add there? Um, no, I, I would just sort of reiterate what Dr. Anton Reich has said, that um, especially if there's a germline mutation, the assumption is that there is also a somatic mutation, whether or not it was identified. Uh, just to point out that, you know, for these studies, they don't require that you identify alterations in both alleles, only uh, one alteration in one of the genes, uh, with the assumption that much of the time there is another alteration in the other allele and that they these are biallelic alterations. But, um, you know, it's a difference between what's happening biologically and what we're able to identify in our assays. And especially for the germline, I think they're usually biallelic. Two, two, questions, two things that I want in the speed round as we have the last couple of minutes. One question I've been asked before is, say you have a deletion of BRCA2. Some people have asked me, well, it doesn't have a mutation. The whole gene is deleted. Is that deleterious? Does that count? What, is our, what do our panelists say? Is that person going to be susceptible? Yes, we should use the frame, uh, the, the word alteration rather than mutation. 
Uh, deletion's even better because then you can't get a, a reversion mutation if you want to get into the nitty gritty, but deletion's even better. Perfect. And the second speed round question is, and I have two actually in the speed round. One is, if you put me on a PARP inhibitor and I don't feel clinically better, I don't feel clinically worse, three months pass and I have no PSA response. And let's say I started out not fifth line, so my PSA was still representative of my burden of disease. Is that enough for you saying like this isn't this isn't working? You don't feel better. Your PSA didn't respond. You know, let's move to something else. And how and when are you making that call? One month, three months? Is there some added benefit? I typically would not give up after three months. It also depends on the the gene. I mean, with a BRCA two patient, I would never give up after three months if there's no PSA decline. A lot of times, even in the patients who end up having ninety percent PSA declines, it can take about nine months for the PSA to begin to decline, decline significantly. Like, like you see a stabilization between month zero and three, and then maybe a small reduction, and then between month six and nine, it just kind of plummets downhill. Um, so I've seen that a couple of times. So these are not like you know the AR therapies where within a month you have like a 90% PSA reduction. We don't see that with PARP. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a slow and gradual decline. Frankly, with, with other genes like ATM, I, I may have a lower threshold to take them off study. Uh, or off, off the drug, uh, but, but in the absence of symptoms, you, you did mention this guy remained asymptomatic. In the absence of symptoms and in the absence of some clinical or radiographic progression, I probably would stick with it. Two other questions. One is, do you ever add on another therapy on top of PARP off-label? I think the answer is going to be not right now, not outside of the context of a trial, but just to ask that. And the second question is, Vander Weyl, you'll give us a 30-second um, synopsis of what is a reversion mutation? Why does that matter? So first 15 seconds to 30 seconds each question. Go, guys. Not right now. The, the potential toxicities when you in, include AR therapies are unknown, and there are some concerns, including cardiovascular risk, specifically with Abby and Olaparib. So don't do it yet, folks. Great. And Dr. Vanderwill, the reversion mutations, what's that all about? Reversion mutation means that there's some secondary mutation that restores the function of the, of the gene. So if you delete the gene, you can't add back in the whole gene. But if there's a single nucleotide mutation or if there is a base pair deletion, you could get another mutation, a secondary, an additional mutation that then restores the function of the gene. And that has been documented in patients after developing resistance um, on PARP inhibitors. Perfect. The, uh, and then clinically, you know that they're not responding. So does it really help you clinically? Uh, reversion mutations? Um, like, do you look no. at them clinically? And if you find one, what would you do? You would just even know more that they're not going to respond? Um, so this is something that's happened once they've already been treated and presumably initially responded, but now have developed secondary resistance. And the reason they developed resistance is because they, um, they regained the function of the gene that wasn't working initially. Um, but, you know, there's still resistance, so I'm still moving on to something else. So, yeah. so, so Dr. Ross, real quick, the, the, the real important question with reversions is, will these patients be um, sensitive or not to subsequent platinums? Because a lot of times we use platinum chemotherapy, like cisplatin or carboplatin in these patients. And, you know, in other cancers, like ovarian cancer, the, there is cross resistance. The, these reversion mutations, not only do they, you know, can, can they cause platinum resistance in some cases, but platinum therapy itself, in the absence of the ever having received the PARP, can cause reversions in BRCA1 and 2, in, in breast and ovarian cancer. I, I don't think that the issue is resolved, but I would be more inclined, let's say, to follow up if it's a fourth, fifth line patient, elaborate with, let's say, carboplatin. If I don't see a reversion mutation, then if I did. Perfect, perfect. Thank you both. I'll turn now, get back the, the seminar back over to the, to the AUA. Uh, thank you all for being here. Stay on just a few moments longer. And thank you to both Dr. Antonarakis and Vanderwill for a phenomenal discussion and for the AOA for putting this program together.